Welcome back to the Sleepers Podcast. Wednesday, April 17th. We're recording this Tuesday morning. Carter, how did your men's league game go last night? Uh, you know, it was one of those games where uh, I got my stats, but it did not lead to winning. Uh, I'm not sure what you want to call that player. So every game? Uh, relax. Let's not do that. Uh, we're actually on a pretty good win streak as of late. Um, I'm not one to point fingers, but let's just say uh, – I was down low the whole game yesterday, uh, besides probably about four or three point attempts. I didn't shoot one free throw. I'm not, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying it's on strikes, but you're telling me that I'm shooting all those shots down low and I'm not getting hit once. <laughs> I mean, it's tough. Uh, were you fading away a little bit? Were you a little finessed no, out you know, there? I, you know what? I, I, I think a couple of the jump hooks, I did a little bit of the Zach Eady, like fade away a little bit. But I noticed that I did that. I started going way more towards the basket in this case. And, uh, yeah, I just – I didn't get one call. I did get a tech, of course, because on one of them I got hit in the face. Like, my glasses literally fell off my face because I got hit and raked across the arm. No call. Um, still wearing the goggles. The no. Huh? Still wearing the goggles? Yeah, still wearing the goggles. So I let the ref know, like, you don't see this? Like you think they just came off my head? I got I just got whacked across the face, John. <laughs> so what what'd you end up with numbers wise? I probably had let's see, I hit <laughs> let me add this up. I had three I had three threes. So there's nine right there. I probably had twenty one. Okay. Twenty one, probably ten and six. Three threes, huh? Yeah. Some of them were late. Some were garbage time, I must say. Okay. Did you hit the the this celebration, the more? I did hit that after a layup, yeah. <laughs> That's exciting to me. Uh, yeah. So this is like, did you see the, there's a college football player from Pitt who hit the portal, and they asked why, and he was just like, well, yeah, we can't win. We're not ready to win right now. Uh, is that you on your men's league team right now? No, I'm right with my guys, man. Uh, we, we had some adversity. Um Guys were just a little bit off yesterday. Only had five guys. Um, so I think, you know, vibes were just a little bit off, but we'll, we'll make it work. Okay. All right. Well, an inspired performance, it sounds like. Excited for today's episode. We have some good things to get to. We're going to go back to our roots, which means we're going to talk some of our favorite Big Ten teams. Uh, Illinois has some staff changes ongoing. Michigan State, I have no idea what the F is happening. We're going to just dive right into that. And then uh, there's a crazy number of prestigious players in the portal right now that I have a stat on that I want to talk big picture. What does that mean for college basketball? But first, the Carter Elliott YouTube comment of the day. A lot to choose from today. I'm trying to find one that isn't very combative, honestly. A very combative day in the YouTube comments, I would say. BBN did not on. like our Reed Shepard, Mark Pope takes. But for the record, I, I want to shout out John Martin. We love John Martin. He's basically on a rampage on Twitter saying the same things we are. Like putting putting this type of pressure on Reed Shepard as Mark Pope to return to school is insanely selfish. Yeah, very, very true. Um, let's see. Go from Mick Carter here. Guess anyone can have a podcast talk shit about people and coaches with no facts to back it up. First, there's no guarantee Reed is a top lottery pick. Yeah, there is. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of projections that he's talking to a kid about his future isn't a crime. Rather, he comes back or not just because he said being a head coach is like being a shepherd. And really, it is kind of you putting words in Mark Pope's mouth. He never said my whole H-O-L-E, whole recruiting strategy is getting Reed to return. If a coach doesn't want the best players to return, then you don't care about winning. And clearly Mark and Jeff are friends. And this decision is up to the Shepherd family. I would, I, okay. My next challenge here, I challenge anyone to show me a mock draft that doesn't have Reed Shepherd in the lottery. I would love to see that. Yeah. Let anyone. me just add, if, if we're doing what did Mark Pope say or not say, how about what he actually said yesterday, which was not at his press conference, which was, I've been doing a lot of praying that Reed Shepard will come back to Kentucky. So that's what we're doing. Like, 
let's just be clear. This kid should not return to Kentucky. It is in the worst interest of this kid's professional future to return to college. He will never be drafted higher than he would be going to the draft this season. And if you're going to sit there and say you don't care about that kid's professional future, you care about your own success as a coach in college more, that's fine, but just spell it out. Say that. Because that's what Mark's, Mark Pope is doing. Kentucky fans want to pretend that's not what he's doing. It's insane. There's very few coaches in the country that operate that way. Apparently, Mark Pope is one of them right now. That's fine. But call it what it is. Don't make it like we're twisting his words. No, that's what he's doing. That's what he's saying. He's praying. He's begging the Lord God above to do some work and send Reed Shepard back into his ice-cold hands. I just assume he has cold hands. I was just gonna say, why, why, where's the where's the cold hand assumptions coming Don't from? Don't you here? think he just has like like always? You know how sometimes you like hold someone's hand; it's like warm and comforting. I feel like Mark Pope has frosty hands. I could see that honestly. Yeah, that's where I'm at. Okay. You, you also said you were gonna choose a non-combative comment, and then that's the one you landed on. <laughs> there was I honestly, I would have had to keep scrolling to find an eye. It's very combative in there today. <sighs> Great off-season, mid-season form. Feels great. <laughs> Gotta Full love swing. it. Gotta love it. Uh, okay. To the Discord comments, join the Discord. Link in the description of this video. Uh, I don't think we've had any new new users join. We've seen some names pop up but not get to the paid portion of the show recently. That makes me sad. Stop making me sad. $9.99 a month to join the Discord. Get your comments read every single day on the show. It's the number one way to support us and keep the lights on in the offseason for Sleepers Media. Uh, we still have like 275, I think, members in the Discord right now. Would love to see that number get to 300 sometime this summer. We start with Fam, who says, How many wins are you adding to Kentucky's 2024 win total after Mark Pope and the 1996 boys drove the bus into a packed house at Rupp? I personally think that adds three wins. Uh, it adds zero wins. I think it subtracts two wins. Mark, the, yeah, this Mark, Mark Pope versus us is going to be a, a long thing this year. It really is. It's going to be generated. Do you feel good about our battle against Mark Pope? I feel great about where we're at. I The only thing I don't like is I don't like having to go to war with BBN. I like BBN. Yeah. Like, I, but that's why, like, oh. I'm not going to compromise my standards for BPN, B, BBN. Sorry. And BBN is compromising their standards. I want BBN to keep being BBN. And right now, BBN's not acting like BBN. Yeah, we, we expect greatness, and you should too. You're, you're the bluest of blue bloods. Behave like it. Don't be Iowa. Be in Iowa. You're literally blue. You are blue. Yeah, it's tough. Boom Fizzle says, thoughts on this job tier list? Given the way hiring has gone for some of these openings in the last few years, what would be your list? Uh, it's a graphic that says best jobs in college basketball. Tier one is the blue bloods, North Carolina, Kentucky, Kansas, Duke, UConn. Tier two Arizona, Michigan, Michigan State, Louisville, Texas, UCLA, Ohio State, Indiana, Villanova. Some other ones that jump out is just interesting where they've placed here. Illinois, Houston, Tennessee, Gonzaga, Tier 3. Then we have Wisconsin, Purdue, among others, in Tier 4. How do you feel about that? So I like Tier 1. Um, I think there could be some movement between tier three and tier two, though. I, I, I'm not sure about, I'm not sure how that, I'd like to see the guidelines on how those, how that kind of gets placed. Cause yeah. I feel like, you don't, don't, don't you think Gonzaga should be in two? Uh, I don't know where to place Gonzaga. I'm okay having them in tier three. Cause I, I do wonder what a post mark for you Gonzaga looks like. Um, yeah. they are still in the West coast conference after all. Yeah. True. Sure. Yeah, I, I'd have to I'd have to dive into actual placing it. Maybe we could actually do a topic where we rate jobs. Yeah, I would like that. I think Illinois should be tier two. I don't think Michigan's a better job than Illinois. Um, was was Illinois in tier three? Illinois was in tier three. Michigan was in tier two. Yeah, I don't know about that. Yeah, I would also I'd put UCLA in tier one. Um, I get there. They haven't had the recent success the way the other five blue bloods have. But to me, the right coach is at UCLA. They are right back to operating like any of the other schools. Was Texas in there? Texas is tier two. Okay, I'm good with that. Yeah. Villanova tier two. 
yeah, a lot of a lot of Big Ten schools: Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Indiana, but not Illinois. Interesting. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, also, Purdue tier four. Is that right? Maybe because you don't want to be after Painter. I, I don't know, or maybe because like I don't know, like maybe not the best NIL or something like that. I don't know. The only thing that makes me feel like Purdue should be higher is how great the fan base is. Like you get insanely good fan support if you win at Purdue. Um, but honestly, maybe that's a takeaway is like Painter doing what he's done at Purdue at a tier four job is pretty damn impressive. Yeah. I'd give that guy a call if I had a tier one or two opening. Certainly would. Uh, Burner605 is on me from reading a comment yesterday. He says, I completely ignored the Scott Frost part of one of his comments. Yeah, I, I replied and said this, but uh, when we're doing two weeks worth of comments and it's taken like an hour 45, I'm censoring anything after the first two sentences. God bless our Discord community. But if I can get to the gist of the question by summarizing it in two sentences without reading like 400 words per comment, I will do that. So sorry, Burner. You did make a funny Scott Frost joke at the expense of Mark Pope. Yeah. How do you spell gist? I always struggle with that. Is it G is it G I S T or J I S? Is it J? I think it's G I S T. Okay. Yeah. It's just is a very underrated word. You like the word gist? I kind of do. Like I kind of like like the fact that you just used it right there gave me a little good feeling inside. Okay. Let's move on. Ulamog says, Does Purdue win the same amount of games last year? If they played basketball by quarters where the bonus resets every quarter, but it's always two shots in the bonus, maybe a summer project for Guy had to save this comment post mailbag show so it would get addressed properly. First off, that's great comments, thread behavior from Ulamog. He read the room correctly. We appreciate that. Second off, Guy, uh, we have big plans in store for Guy this offseason. Love Guy. Guy was doing some photoshops for us yesterday. Great work as always, Guy. Uh, where's your transfer announcement graphic, by the way? Guy made you one, and then you just didn't do anything with hey, it? Hey, hey, can you relax? Well, you didn't do anything with it. You asked for it and made I, it seem like I, it was time-sensitive. You, you haven't done anything. Can you relax? You haven't done anything with it. <laughs> it's not time-sensitive. I want it prepared. <laughs> You're just sitting on it? <laughs> relax. Okay, all right. Uh, so what do you think? Does Purdue, does Purdue win the same amount of games last year if if yes. games were played by quarters with bonus resets? Yes, they do. I think they might lose like one more game along the way. So, so basically, so basically they win the same. Man. Basically, the same. they're they're equally as good. Yes. Uh, Umar Balo, who I believe this used to be Doctor Doctor, and now he's Umar Balo with a picture of Umar Balo in an Indiana shirt, says, uh, "Hey, new to the Discord here. I came from the Bleacher Report stream and was wondering what kind of deals you have on the latest cell phones." I'm, I'm glad everybody got a kick out of that. I don't I'm think sure it was. I don't think it was as bad as people are making it out to be. First, yeah, I thought we get that shit on. Confused Illini fan says, what expectations, if any, do you have for the Illini next year? This team is returning barely anyone, and the best transfer we've landed so far is an inconsistent 18-year-old. We just lost our second best incoming freshman, said Sears leaving, Hansberry too, possibly. Seems like it could be a down year for Illinois. While I'd love to think we have multiple years of eligibility left for everyone on the roster right now, it's hard not to be a pessimist and think 50% of them will be gone by next offseason. Your thoughts? Well, one, I don't think you should be thinking about next offseason whatsoever with Illinois. It's an offseason by offseason basis. And Brad's going to bring in guys. I, I I think he's shown that. I don't doubt that. Maybe it's moving a little bit slower than you want to this year. But he's going to bring in guys. The Damascus coming back thing is still a possibility, even if it's a small possibility. Um, and, you know, Merez is still on the way. Merez is going to be a monster. Uh it's it's not all doom and gloom right now. Uh, maybe it's moving a little bit slower than maybe a lot of I fans would like, and things are going as well as they would like. But uh, I'm not doubting Brad when it comes to the portal. He's gonna get guys. Okay, that's a measured response. Uh, yeah, I I'm just gonna give Brad like another month. Let's wait and see what it looks like. But I do agree. Right now, I am somewhat uninspired by the roster as is. You need a big fish or two big fish. Um, 
but we'll see. They've surprised me before. They'll probably surprise me again. Eric and Jay Boiler. Sorry, uh, real quick. Does Boswell count as a big fish? He's a medium fish. He's a medium fish? Okay. But right now, he's the biggest fish in Champagne. Got it. If I want to know. Eric NJ Boiler 96 says, I paused the pod to write this. The polo shirt story is the reason you need a merch store. The black polos are great, but you can offer multiple colors and then both wear sleepers gear that doesn't match next time. By the way, a basketball orange polo where you flip the colors and the basketball logo is black with orange seams would be nice too. Uh, yeah, love the sentiment of this comment. I agree with it. I appreciate the interest in merch for us. Um, where we are at with merch, we need to find a manufacturer slash distributor that is cost effective for us. Not as easy as it sounds. Uh, I have worked with a couple local in-house shops, friends of friends, et cetera, that have made great stuff on a limited basis. They are not well suited for large orders. Like we, I either need to give them like minimum order quantities where they need 20 of one product being ordered to even print them or it, they're expensive to order like one-offs as we go. Uh, in the past, we've done the one-offs thing and we've just kind of ate the cost. But if we want to unveil a store, I want to make it something that everyone can order whenever they want and not have to worry about order minimums. Like the last thing I want is people placing an order and then not getting their shit for six months because other people didn't order enough. So the the one solution I have found that works is Shopify online like commerce store where you can drop ship things. My problem with Shopify, Shopify is definitely the best option. I've seen Shopify stores in use for other platforms before. I've received shirts from those manufacturers. They're not great quality, just straight up, not great quality. So the the stuff that Carter and I wear, the polo that Tristan has that we sent him as a one-off, like I think it's great quality. It's like a really nice embroidered Adidas shirt that fits great, like dry fit material. I want to get that. I want to make that available to people. Haven't found the right person to help us do that. We did have one uh, Chicago-based site reach out to us in March that wanted to spin a store up for us. Seemed really promising. And then about a week into working with them, they were trying to launch a store with just one design on the store. And I was like, I we're going to launch this. I want to have multiple products. I don't want to just have one logo t-shirt and that's it. So haven't found the right partner. I am working on it. It's not priority one a for me on a day to day, but like the goal is to have something spun up this summer. And uh, if anyone has a lead, if anybody thinks they could help get this done, reach out to us, let us know. We would love to figure it out. 100%. Our DMs are open. I already forgot how to pronounce this guy's name, but he praised me for getting it right the last time. Kai Gooch? Does that sound right? Kai Gooch? Kai Gooch? Kai Gudge? Kai Gooch? I don't know. Kai? Kai, Kai? Kai says early Big Ten freshman of the year predictions from y'all. And how good do you believe catchings will be for Purdue? Also, great content from Phoenix. Excited for the summer. Thank you, Kai. Appreciate it. Who are your early Big Ten freshman of the year predictions? Oh, good options, I think. Um, I'm going to go uh, – I'm going to go one of the two Rutgers kids. I think you have to, right? Yeah. Um, one of the two Rutgers kids, if not a Rutgers kid, uh, Merez. I like the Merez shout. Um, no Derek Queen? No Cannon Catchings? Kevin Willard. Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. Um, uh, yeah, I think the the correct answer would be one of the Rutgers guys. Which Rutgers guy are you taking? To win freshman of the year? Dylan Harper. Okay, I'll take Ace Bailey. Okay. He'll go either way. But this goes against my Rutgers is going to stink take. So <laughs> I, I think it. you're going to come around on that. I That's why I didn't address it as much. You're going to come around. I want him to be good. I just like Steve Peichel is the worst offensive coach at the high major level. Right now he is. I, 
I, I don't think he's getting Greg, anything. This this 187th ranked offense is going to feed families. <laughs> I can't wait. Quick thoughts on catchings for Purdue. I, I think he's really good. I like I I see him being a contributor, but I think this is where I differ from Purdue fans. I see him as a contributor, like a good contributor too. Like maybe even a contributor to the fact where he could be an NBA player after year one. But there's like a lot of like cannon catches is going to come in and like average like 15 points and like six rebounds. I don't see that, but I see him being like like a nine and nine and five guy, something like that. Um, but like having some really big games in like in that time span, but maybe having some down ones as well. I just I I don't see him being able to come in right away and just be like this dominant force. Yeah, the the trajectory I would compare it to the most is Jaden Ivey's career at Purdue, where Ivy was not even like a huge rotation piece early. And then about two and a half months through his freshman year, it was like, oh shit, we got something. And then they started feeding him more minutes. And then he had a really good finish to his freshman year. And then he was a superstar sophomore year. I think that could happen for Cannon. Uh, I Purdue fans might not like this. I'm going to just call it what it is. If you're a freshman looking for immediate impact role, I don't think Purdue is the place for you. I, Matt Painter has not ever put a player one and done to the league. That's part of why Purdue is so good. But like, it's by design. Like y'all, you have had some guys come in that could have gone straight to the pros that by design do not. Uh, and I understand it sounds a little stupid to say that on a team that just started Braden Smith and Fletcher lawyer as freshmen. And those guys were really good, but different situation there. Like th those guys came in and there were no other option really. Right. Like they tried to get Nigel pack. It didn't work. And then Matt painter was like, well, I guess we're going to rock with Braden. Uh, there will be other options on this team than Cannon Catchings, right? You could play Heidi at the four. You, If you want to play Heidi and Colvin together, you're going to have to play them at the three and the four. Depending on what shakes out in the front court, you still might have Caleb first hanging around. There are going to be guys that are not Cannon Catchings that are available to play minutes. And uh, if Cannon has to play most of his minutes at the four, I think he will be worse off than if he could play some at the three. Like I just, Physically, that's a totally different challenge. And to me... He's not going to be able to play many minutes at the three because Colvin and Heidi are right there. So, um, yeah, I, I love him long term. Think he could be a two and done guy. Think you'll see him as a big part of the rotation by the end of the season. Do not expect him to come in and, and start and play 25 minutes the first game of the season. Oh, apparently, okay. they, apparently a lot of people see him as like the starting four. Yeah, I, that's a good thing for Purdue if that happens because that means he's a super duper star. But um, again, that to me, that would go in conflict with the way Painter has managed guys this talented in the past. He doesn't usually do that. Uh, same old Lions says, thank you for gassing up the root beer stand. Let the people know as a Kalamazoo native, the weekend it opened up, my parents would load us up in the car for our annual pilgrimage to the root beer stand on West Ninja. Yeah, root beer stand rocks. It's the best. I live like three minutes from that root beer stand on West Ninja. How come you never taken it there? Uh, to be honest, like, well, a couple reasons. When you guys come, if we are going to a meal, we try to like impress. So we usually go out to dinner. Hate to be impressed. Yeah. Root, root beer stand is more like, oh, we're just chilling at the crib today. Somebody make a run to the stand and bring the dogs home. All right. That's a bar right there. I'm going to hit the stand. Fire. I'll be back in 10. It's fire. I, I do that maybe once a month in the summer. It's great. Uh, Tristan Freeman says for Carter, more disappointing Michigan state's portal run so far, or me somehow having better sleepers gear than you. Um, probably Michigan state's portal run. Um, but I will say that it is disappointing that I don't think you put that shit on Tristan. Like, I think you had a better polo than me, but I didn't think that you rocked it with the confidence that it needed to be rocked with. Your relationship with Tristan one of my favorite relationships on the planet. He just pisses me off. Did you enjoy him in person in Phoenix? I did enjoy Tristan. He's a good guy, but he's uh I think I want to fight Tristan. <laughs> Why? He's so nice. I know, but like he needs to be fought. I don't know if I agree with that at all. 
I agree with it. I I really don't. Uh, I love you, Tristan. Middle name Mateen says, Greg, you mentioned to Rudy Gay that he was great in 2K, but I think it went over his head. Wonder what your guys' all-time 2K sleeper squad is looking like. Here's mine. Tony Roten, Kevin Martin, Anthony Morrow, Rudy Gay, Thon Maker. It's a good squad. Thon Maker was putting up double-doubles for me in the mid-2000s. It was a good squad. Um, I, I don't know if I can do a full squad. I'm not the biggest two. I really fell off from 2K. Like I used to play 2K all the time in college, but – I think like after 2K16 or 2K17, like I just completely fell off playing 2K at all. Um, but Brandon Roy was is probably my greatest 2K player of all time. I used Brandon Roy and Lamarcus Aldridge all the time. Like that was my go-to team. Marcus Aldridge is one of my favorite players. Um, that's that's my 2K goats right there. I like that. Mine would include Brandon Jennings, Michael Beasley. OJ Mayo, uh, Rudy Gay. I want to put Carmelo in there, but he, I feel like he's too good for this exercise. Um, ben Simmons. Ben Simmons at the five cheat code. Really? Yeah. You put him at the five, everything changes. Yeah. You still play 2K? No, I have not. This is the first, this year is the first 2K that I did not buy in uh, the wow. last 15 years. Dad, got a life's got to change. Yeah, has the Xbox been fired up at all since Merce's uh, birth? Yeah, I played the PGA 2K game. Gotcha. All of my free time is now spent on golf-related activities. It is what it is. Hyena Scar says, have we gotten prospective rankings for upcoming draft classes? And if this matters as much as transfers anymore? I, I I think I might have misunderstood that question because the last part threw me off. Are they asking about upcoming draft classes? Yeah, I think he wants to know, are the upcoming draft classes, like, are they strong? Are they weak compared to this current Oh, one? they're much, 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 much stronger. This is one of the weakest draft classes of all time that we're about to the, – the weakest drafts we're about to watch right now. But next season you got, like, Cooper Flagg in the fold, Ace Bailey – there's a it's it's much more uh there's I think there's maybe a little bit more star power probably a lot more star power but also more consistency I think throughout the draft um you know and then you're looking past that you got guys like uh AJ uh Dynaspa Dynaspa I'm sorry if I mispronounced his last name Debanta what Debanta Debanta yeah Debanta you know the cold pizza of the world um yeah there's a there's a lot more I think talent coming up in these uh, upcoming draft classes. Does that matter as much as transfer classes? I I think it still matters because, well, actually, I think it's going to matter less moving forward because we're about to get out of the COVID year thing. Okay. Like, this is the last year of it, technically. Like, we're going to have, like, those guys. Who knows what's going to happen after that, but I think the landscape of college basketball is going to look different than it has the past couple of years. Okay. I hope so. I hate this landscape. I'm not I kind, I kind of like I, honestly. I'm I'm all good for just let guys play five years. Who cares? Let, let guys play forever. You should never have to leave college basketball. Just be a life. Yeah. Give me an 11 year college well, basketball contract. If you if if there was a player who could play college basketball as long as they wanted, who would it be? Brad Davison. <laughs> Brad, da- Brad he'd, Davison he'd, would still be Wisconsin right now. He never would have left, and he'd be so happy. Also. This is like a longer topic one day, but I just want to make it extremely clear. We could fix all the problems with college basketball, the portal, NIL, frustrations, all of it, if we just allowed kids to sign contracts. Like, coming out of high school, you could sign a two-year contract to a school, and you have to honor that contract. That's that simple. Like, you want to sign a one-year deal? Sign a one-year deal, and then you can go elsewhere the next summer. Sign a four-year deal? Fine. Get the most money possible because that school wants to keep you for four years. But like, would that not literally just fix everything? Uh, it, you, on the surface level, it would, but you know how messy it would get with contracts. It would get like so messy. Why? Like, because there there might be like incentive based things on there. There might be all types. Yeah, of, that's great. That's great. It's it's great. It's great until things don't go well. What wouldn't go well? Like, if a player doesn't meet yeah. their incentives, they're they're tied to their contract still. Breach, contract. breach a con- breach a contract. Uh, I don't know this. I just think it would get messy. I think it's, I think it would solidify everything. I think it's as messy as it can possibly be right now. Personally. I see. I don't think that you just like the mess. You're one with the mess these days. 
I am, I am a mess. No, you're one with the mess. That's much different. Uh, ha, 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 ha. Oh, the last thing on the draft class, I want to go on record and say that Matas Buzelis is going to be the best player in this draft. I like that pick. Yeah. I I get there's no like traditional number one, but I I will stick my fork in the Buzelis corner and say he's going to be a dude. Good grief. Okay. Um. Yeah, we can move on. <laughs> Guy took a screenshot that says Malik Perry is typing, and then just said heroin. <laughs> <laughs> Malik Perry says, I would like to say I don't think Purdue will be terrible, Carter, the little cat buyer. Purdue has no one on the roster with a successful season without Edie. I'm hearing this freshman is good. TKR is a problem. Heidi wearing shoes, no socks, and a tight chain. No one on this returning roster lead a team. But running a new offense is the key. You forgot defense. Edie is gone. Lance is gone. So stop having high hopes for a team that is starting a new era. I wish Malik would look at this lens through his own team. Yeah, is it Michigan State starting a new era? So is Malik not allowed to have high hopes because Tyson Walker and AJ Hogarth are gone? I uh, Malik brother, just keep on being you. Never ever change. Ever. Malik Malik says Carter doesn't have the grind gene. Every time you mentioned my name, he was like, "Here we go." It's good to see Chef Greg cooking again. Roast your team, my team, any team. I love it. Welcome back, guys. He wear a chef hat. Next couple episodes, you have. I one? just I appreciate Malik acknowledging. I'll roast my team. I'll roast your team. I'll roast anyone's team. That's the mindset. It's the reality. Yeah, you're a roaster. You don't have the grind gene. I I guess I don't. I feel like I do. Well, you are a grinder. You've gone on record and said run from the grind, so that makes sense. It maps. I run from the grind, but. I also grind once I run from it. Like I run from one grind and go to the next grind before I run from that grind. Got it. Okay. Uh, Malik follows that up by saying, I'm in the process of making a bet with a Purdue fan in the discord who I respect a lot. Greg, tell why you think Purdue is a contender for the championship. Uh, I think they are a contender for the championship because Matt Painter is one of the five best coaches in college basketball. Braden Smith is the best point guard in the country next season. And I truly believe TKR is a plug and play all Big Ten starting center. I think Cam Heidi is going to take a huge jump. I think Miles Colvin's good. Fletcher Lawyer's good. They're basically one piece away from being an immediate Final Four contender, and I need to see what that final piece looks like, but they're right there. I agree. Last comment from Malik. He says, guy needs an intern job this summer. Please help him. Carter, I'm very real. I'm out with my Black Force energy. Guy doesn't need an internship with us. I think Guy needs like an internship at the local marina. Like he needs to shake hands with yacht with yacht owners. Oh, that's true. Yeah. 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 Uh Guy Guy was giving us some grief for not paying him yesterday. Let's remind the people Guy is in high school. It's illegal to employ a high schooler, as far as I know. Number one. Number two, uh, I tried to pay Guy. And both Guy and his mom reached out to tell me that I can't pay guy. So I, what am I supposed to do here? Yeah. Also, we're a child labor podcast. Okay. <laughs> Final boss Sully says, talk about the greatest 2024-25 season bet of all time. Let them know Sully taking everything. Yeah, last night in the Discord was a classic night in the Discord. We had about four hours of Mark Pope banter. Me versus Sully. Me versus UK. honestly I was taking everybody on I feel like I came out victorious for the record but uh Sully and I ended with a three-part Kentucky season-long bet that involves us going to Kentucky Arkansas in Lexington and uh if he loses some legs of the bet there's a result here where he has to wear a Pope costume to his local Chili's for 14 consecutive days and then tweet out a picture with a caption of my choosing about Mark Pope What do you have to do if you lose? Nothing that difficult. I once again yeah. swindled. <laughs> oh, God, you guys got to be better than that. Fam33 says, leave it to sleepers to be sponsored by my bookie, but get forced into banning their own betting channel. Hashtag bring back betting. We did delete the betting channel in the Discord. Uh, that's just me following Discord policy. What do you want from me? Hey, we, we're a rule following podcast and Discord. Though we might 
bend the rules a little bit, we'll always follow the rules. With that said, go bet on my bookie. Link in the description. <laughs> uh, Tribal Chief UK says, nah, this AI stuff is getting out of hand. I didn't even mention what teams you are fans of. Uh, he has a poem that he wrote that I guess I'm obligated to read here. Uh, it, I think this is chat GPT, a duo of basketball minds, a poem for Carter Elliott and Greg Waddell in Michigan's land where basketball reigns, two voices emerge breaking chains, Carter and Greg, a dynamic pair with sleepers media a story to share Carter Elliott, the Spartan fan, true in green and white. His heart beats anew MSU's glory, his passion untold through victories and defeats, his loyalty, bold Greg Waddell, an alum of the Spartans' domain, with knowledge deep as the ocean's main. Together they stand, a powerhouse duo, bringing insights that fans cherish and know. Sleepers Media, their platform to shine, where college hoop stories intertwine. Michigan State's tale they beautifully craft, with expertise and love that forever last. On the field of 68, they found their place, covering games with skill and grace. For Spartan fans near and far away, Carter and Greg make every day. So here's to Elliot and Waddell so grand, guiding fans through basketball's wonderland. Their voices echo in Michigan's air, a duo so special beyond compare. I guess a snatch of that. Gave me a lot of Michigan State credit, but that's okay. Uh, Malik is back. <laughs> Says, I feel bad for Jaden Shoot. He didn't get to play at Duke at all, really. Hope he gets minutes at a good school. I know a school he gets some minutes at. Malik then says, Do you think any Kentucky players will follow their old coach? Uh, to answer that question, yes. Yeah. Can Cal's players to Cal? 100%. Mark Pope's players to Mark Pope? 95%. Little oh, bit, 95? A little bit out there. Just a tiny little bit. Mark Pope. Let's break it. Malik also says strange dusty is very active in the portal is always not so active Greg do you think you're being too hard on your new coach while he's putting together a new team which ain't easy uh I don't I don't think so like I'm I'm not out here killing dusty I think dusty's making all the right moves right now he's recruiting the right people he's shaking the right hands he's kissing the right babies he's making the right phone calls he's going to the right golf outings dusty's doing the the work he hired a good staff I need to know if this guy has a killer instinct and can close. That, that's what I'm waiting on. The moment he closes on someone that I believe is a good basketball player, we're here. We're so back. But, like, right now there's just smoke for 11 different players, and none of that smoke is turning to fire. And the longer that lasts, it, it terrifies me. Yeah. I mean, it, all it takes is one, though, like you said. I mean, Jake Diebler's out here getting McDonald's All-Americans. Like Jake, Jake Diebler's De- cooking right now. That's that's my issue. Jake Diebler is cooking. I repeat, Jake Diebler is cooking. Like, I believe in my bones I got the best coach in this coaching cycle. Need to see him close something that's not George Washington the third. Uh, Jeep Man says, I listened to a lot of comments on portal needs for Illinois to replace players that were lost from this last year's team. What about incoming freshmen? Will Merez Johnson be an instant impact player in the Big Ten, or will he need some time to develop for the college game? I think Merez is going to be an instant impact guy. Um, I think he has the body, the frame to do so. Uh, I think he's gonna he's not going to, like, dominate games like he did at the high school level. I think there is going to be some adjustment period, obviously, uh, coming into the Big Ten. But I think he's going to be an impact guy right away. I, I don't doubt that at all. Yeah, I believe he's going to be really, really good. I hope he starts for them day one, but you never know with uh, Brad's portal. He might get a better player. Dylan Terpstra says, if each of you could choose one recruit you wish your team could have landed in the last five years, who would it be? Has to be someone your school was realistically in the run for. Oh, last five years. Recruit, meaning high school kid, not transfer here? I'm guessing, yeah. Let's let's run it that way because if it was transfer, mine would be Terrence Shannon without question. Everything would look different. Yeah. Oh, who would it be? Last five years. See, I can think back to like, like some guys that I wish you would have got past the five year mark easily. The like, hard I part. Like, the, the, oh, go ahead. Sorry, my bad. No, no, no. I was gonna say like I think like you know um, Jabari Parker. Like I thought that was very real. Uh, that's the one that always sticks out in my mind. Uh, but I kind of have to think a little bit harder. You can go. I'm about to think. Well, the hard quick. the hard part for Michigan State in the last five is most of the primary targets didn't end up being good. Like you were like yeah. Jalen Shoot, Isaac Trout, Ty Rogers, Enoch Boache are like the four big misses, and those guys combined to be half of one good player. Like what about Kareem? What about Kareem Man? 
Yeah, like just uh, none none of these dudes actually turned into good college basketball players. So I yeah, yeah I'll well, let you think on that one. But I'll I'll do a I'm a cheat real quick and I'll say a transfer. Jalen, I'm I it hurt missing on Jalen Bridges. For sure. He would have been great. I think he would have been um, great. Is it, there's definitely at least one high schooler from Michigan State in the last couple of years that ended up. I just I, I can't I truly can't think of who it is right now, but I don't know. For Michigan, uh, I'll say Isaiah Collier. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. he would have been very good. And, uh, yeah, wouldn't have had to deal with all the Doug issues if you have Isaiah Collier. Your Serbian Boiler says if for the first game of the season you could schedule one opponent to perform a Survivor-style raid on, who would it be? For clarification, if you beat them, you can take one player from their team. If you lose, they take your best player. This might be a better exercise to do closer to the start of the season. Just trying to hook you guys up with some comments. Well, I appreciate the comment. Okay, so this has got to be strategic in this case because you want a good player, but you also want to play a team you think you can beat. I don't know who we can. I don't know who you can beat right now. <laughs> I don't know my team. So <laughs> yeah. All right. So maybe we got to wait. Can we? Can we? Pop, can we put this one on ice? Yeah, I'd like to schedule Michigan State for my first game of the season. Uh, let's, what do you want? Let's just get it out of the way. It's it's Michigan versus Michigan State. Your best versus my new coach's best. Your Hall of Fame head coach's best versus my brand new coach's best. Who, who are you? Ta- who are you taking? Um, it's not like he wouldn't even impact things that much, but like deep down in his heart, he belongs in maize and blue. Jay Nakins. <laughs> I've said it for two two years. Like, if the kid actually wants to go to the league, we could have helped you. Possibly. Watched his best friend blossom into a two and done. His best friend? Kobe Bufkin. They're best friends? In, like, fake best friend way. I... <laughs> let, me, let me get my narratives off. Also, the, the upside of playing Michigan State would be if y'all beat us, which would realistically happen because Tom Izzo's a maniac and never loses to Michigan. Uh, Izzo would probably take like our ninth best player. Yeah, he take Jace. Yeah, like he would. He would take someone that just is like a backup small forward. Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. Be great. Uh, Jesse, two parter here. Number one is Diebler going to lead Ohio State to at least a share of the Big Ten title and or a Big Ten tourney championship this year? I think there's a real chance they win the, at least something. Like they're really st- he's starting to cook up something over there. Yeah, I'm going to say no. I'm going to say no. They have a very far way to go here, and uh, Michi Johnson is still the high-profile athlete. If, if, they kept, if they kept Roddy and didn't add Michi, I'd be so disgustingly in on this team. You, you think that I'm on my Buckeyes now? I might have got a part-time season ticket package. Okay. I I hope it works. I like a lot of these individual parts. Um with that said, we're, are we acting like Aaron Bradshaw and Felix Akpara is a good pairing? He See, might. I don't, I don't think they're. Pay, I think Felix Akpara is going to be a bench guy. He might try and play them both. Like we we don't I, know what he's going to do. He. If, I hope not. I hope it's Devin Royal at the four and Bradshaw at the five. It might be Bradshaw, Akpara, Royal, Michi, and Bruce, which would be horrible. Yeah, I hate that. And it very much could be. Those are the five best players on the roster right now. Part two, he says, I think we all agree Malik Perry is a fictional character. Between the two of you, what are your top five fictional characters Malik may be the online alter ego for? (laughs) This is a bad question to ask me to do on the spot because I just can't. I mean, I for a while, I thought Malik was Malik Hall and he was like performing a bit, but... I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's my – I truly think that Malik Hall – not Malik Hall, Malik Perry is in some way or form working for the Michigan State Athletic Department. I don't know what position, but he's he is part of it. I would buy that he's, like, the guy who runs Moneyball in East Lansing. I would buy that he is the Joker, like, as far as <laughs> fictional characters go. Uh, the reality is it's just little elements of all these wonderful people. That all make up the mystery that is Malik Perry, our favorite. Can't there's wait to see him at the Sixers meetup. There's a little bit of Carter Elliott in Malik Perry. Am I Malik Perry? There's a little bit of you in Malik Perry. There, let's be honest about it. Like the violent nature, the humor, the Michigan State ride or die. 
the lack of vocabulary. All right. There's a, there's a lot more that meets the eye. I like it. Okay, those are the comments for today. Join the Discord. Again, it's the number one way to support us. Arguably the only way to support us. Link in the description of this video. Hey, Cart, you know who else supports us? Our friends at my bookie. Oh, do I have the vocabulary and grammar to read this ad, Greg? Or I don't know okay if, if I, you, do that? I don't know if you do have the vocabulary or the grammar to read the ad, but what you do have is the propensity for sports betting and the funds to do so with our friends at my bookie. Yeah, my bookie is the official sports book of Sleepers Media. And though March Madness is over, my bookie is still over there providing all your betting needs right now. You got extra predictions over there. You got odds, boosts, parlays, player props, anything you need. They make it very easy to play your way and get paid. And right now we have a first instant deposit bonus of up to $1,000 by using promo code sleepers. That's promo code sleepers. Take advantage of this deposit bonus right now. Use promo code sleepers. And, you know, NBA playoffs coming up, still some uh, also some soccer, some Champions Leagues coming up as well. Uh, so still plenty of things to bet on. If you are, use my bookie, use our promo code, take advantage of that deposit bonus of up to $1,000. Don't sleep on the fact that I dropped the word propensity right after making fun of your vocabulary, by the way. Your posture sucks. <laughs> Thank you to my bookie. Uh, take advantage of that promo code sleepers. Again, link in the description. There's a lot of links in the description, folks. Check out the description. Let's get to the show. Three topics today. Uh, let's start with the broad one, and then we'll work our way to our teams. Uh, currently, there are 12 McDonald's All-Americans or former McDonald's All-Americans that are in the transfer portal for this cycle in 2024. I'll just read some names here. DJ Wagner, Omaha, Bill Yu, uh, Andre Stoyakovich. Bay Fall, Bronny James, Aiden Holloway, Brandon Garrison, Aaron Bradshaw, Dylan Mitchell, Mark Mitchell, Arterio Morris, Kajani Wright. Some of those guys already committed. Many of them are still in the portal. The point is, if half of an entire McDonald's All-American like season is in the portal, is college basketball broken? Like, what has happened here? Because these are guys, historically, guys who enter the McDonald's All-American game are guys that want to get to the league, one and done. In this era, clearly they're not getting to the league. We're talking about how this is one of the worst draft classes of all time. And McDonald's All-Americans aren't even getting to the league. So now they're just jumping schools. If it doesn't work at the first stop, they're straight to another stop. Maybe stop number two helps them. Maybe it hurts them. Who knows? It's probably going to be situation dependent. But this just feels very unique. We're at a point now where the elite talents coming out of high school are not working at their first school. And then rather than trying to make it in the NBA quickly, they're jumping for another school, cashing in in the process. Why is this happening? What does this mean to you? So first off, the thing to me is that this is a direct correlation. This isn't a surprise to me in this situation because there was a lot of talk amongst media people and just people in this space that this was well known that this this class just wasn't it. Like just compared to last couple All-American, McDonald's All-American classes and high school recruiting classes in general. This class just was not was not on the same level as those other ones. And you combine that with, you know, you sprinkle that in with the, you know, right now, honestly, uh, high school basketball and AU basketball and all that is just not the best space right now in general. It's completely different than what it used to be. And it, it's I don't know if it's as, as conducive to coming into – college basketball and being successful right away. And all those factors, you tie it in with the fact that you have to play 24-year-olds and 23-year-olds immediately when you get into college basketball. It's it's a culture shock. It's honestly a little bit unfair to them, I think, that they have to like come in right away and do that. But I think you are seeing the, – the main point, though, out of this is that this was expected because this high school class was bad. Like, it, it was. So it's not a surprise. Like – uh, Omaha Blue, I think, is could actually be a good college basketball player. He was a top ten recruit. He he, I don't think he would play for anybody, uh, any winning team or major power five team in the country, just because that, it's just it's a reflection of the high school class more than anything. Um, so it's it's not really a surprise in my eyes. It's not just 
this class though, like you're right about this class, especially like Omaha was just bad this season. And some people try to warn us, like they don't think he could play coming in. Uh, Stoyakovich was not what he was expected to be. And he played on a losing team. Uh, DJ Wagner underwhelming compared to the other freshmen at Kentucky who were stellar. Bronny had injury concern, obviously like uh, medical concerns, right. And on a bad team as well. There's also a bunch of guys on this list that aren't from that class. Like Dylan Mitchell's been at Texas a few years. Uh, Mark Mitchell's been at Duke for a few years, giving good minutes, right? Like those those guys have been good starters on good teams. Now they're in the portal. And like, I, I don't know if Mark, Duke wanted Mark Mitchell back. I would assume they do. But they also have loaded freshmen coming in. Uh, Dylan Mitchell, I think, just got recruited over. Like they're, they're bringing in portal guys and losing Tyrese Hunter, losing – Starters, multiple starters. Like, I, I hear you that it was the class's fault this past year, but I do think it's something larger than that in general. And I don't know if it's good for college basketball. Like, I don't I, – I think in general the portal existing and operating the way it is is good. I'm pro-player freedom. I'm pro-player movement. If your situation isn't working, that's fine. But also there's a certain threshold that, like, on a broad level we have to step back and look at. And it – like if 50% of the players in this sport are in the portal in general, that's one thing, but I can understand. I can rationalize more like guys that are good at the mid major level, wanting a better opportunity to me. We're just like, like if McDonald's all Americans are playing at multiple stops every single season and jumping back and forth, that's a fundamental issue for the sport because the most talented kids should not need multiple stops to get where they want to go. Like that's, that means the sport isn't working the way it used to, to me. And I'm worried about it. And I I know, like, my words on this mean nothing. Nothing's going to change about it. But th- th- is, this just feels different. This feels like the first time where, like, even the most talented people in college basketball are now unhappy and saying their situations aren't working. And if they're not happy, then no player is going to be happy. Yeah, but, uh, but at the same time, I you go through that list of McDonald's All-Americans that – are in the transfer portal. Then you go look at mock drafts and there's just a bunch of McDonald's all Americans being drafted too, like top 15 picks. So like, is it really, I mean, you could do it both ways. I'm going through the ringer right now. Stefan Castle, McDonald's all American. Uh, Good. Jared McCain, McDonald's all American. Reed Shepard, Cody Williams, like all these got Rob Dillingham, Jacoby Walter, all these McDonald's all Americans are still, you know, here is Isaiah Collier in there. Like, um, you know, even down to like guys like Kalel Ware, who was an adult, like it's it's still Kalel Ware who transferred. Of... Very true. I guess that goes against it. But so you hate do you hate transferring, Greg? No, I I'm pro transfer. I'm not Izzoing here. I'm very pro transfer. But okay. I like I I think this is getting progressively worse. Is my point? Like the the way the portal worked three seasons ago when it was still new and nobody really knew what was going on was one thing. Then it's like, oh, players realize this is actually a really useful tool for them. Everybody can go find a better situation. I I just think there's a line that has been crossed where, like, the elite players are just doing this just to do it now. And that's that's my my overwhelming issue here. Like, it's it's not the situations where, oh, a kid didn't play and got screwed by a coaching staff and now needs a new situation. This is like dudes who have been playing on good teams who are just like, yeah. I'm going to see what's out there. Like, that's that's not college basketball. It's not. And then this sport is completely unrecognizable to me. And it's fine, but it's also not. Like, if this keeps going and getting worse from here, like, if we get to a point where every single McDonald's All-American every year is just like, I'm out. I'm done. What's the point of this? And, like, if I'm a coach, should you even be recruiting elite high school players anymore? Like, what's if, – if high school stars – are either going to go straight to the league in one year or leave your program for another program after one year and get the biggest bag they can get. Why would you even recruit good high school players? Why would you waste your time on the trail doing that? That's a, that's a great point. But the one the one silver lining maybe you got to look at here is that it might change after this this being the last. Maybe it changes. Maybe it changes after this being the last COVID year thing. Maybe. But it's honestly probably slim because there's no, I, like you said, there's no repercussions to playing and going out there and getting like, honestly, even using a year to showcase, even if you have a good freshman year, like you, 
you can go somewhere else and maybe secure a bigger bag. This is why I want contracts. I want contracts. Out of high school, sign a contract. If Stanford can convince Stoyakovich's kid to sign a two-year deal out of high school, do it. And he has to be there two years. Like that's It would save so much of this to me. And I don't know. I Again, I'm enjoying covering the portal, the movement. In general, I want players to be free. But if the very best players, the most talented kids in this sport even, are like, yeah, I don't care. I, I want to leave. Every summer. If if over 50% of a McDonald's All-American class is like, I'm gone, I don't know how we save this. I don't know how we make college basketball even recognizable at all to what it's been since I've been a little kid. I don't know. Contracts would be a start, but it's weird times in the sport. Let's move on. Illinois has some staff changes ongoing. We talked about it in one of our videos yesterday, the Sincere Harris portal announcement. Chester Frazier is taking a job on West Virginia's staff. Uh, that, to me, feels like a lateral move. Reading between the lines here, your card says it's money. Is it money? I don't. I, I'm. 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 I'm guessing. Oh, I'm guessing here. I'm. I'm okay. thinking that uh, if I'm not mistaken, West Virginia has numerous, numerous bags, like big bags. Uh, they do with players at least, so that would that would seem to yeah, be yeah. So that so it's, it's it's a guess by me, but sorry, I didn't cut you off. You're good. No, it's fine. Um, yeah, it just reading between the lines here, I don't think Illinois was shocked by Chester's departure. Like that's that's what I have heard. Now, again, I get information from multiple places. We are by no means the Illinois experts. We are just people that like reacting and talking about Illinois basketball. Um, I. I I think this was like a Brad decision more than it was Chester wanting to leave. That's what I've believed to be true based on things I've heard from multiple people. Uh, I said this in the other video. I applaud that. Like if Brad has identified something he thinks is a weakness in his organization and that weakness stems from Chester Frazier and the players he has recruited that haven't been good enough to earn starter minutes on his teams, then you go out and you fix it. To me, that's what Brad has done here. Chester Frazier going to West Virginia is not something that's going to cripple Illinois basketball. Obviously, Chester Frazier is an alum. Uh, I don't want to call him a legend, but like he's a he's a program guy, right? Like when you're within the family of a program and you leave for another program that at best is a lateral move. Obviously, that's a little bit of a weird vibe, but it doesn't seem like there's any bad blood here. It seems like everybody's on the same page, and it seems like some players are going to go with Chester Frazier. So uh, we already have Sincere in the portal. Amani Hansberry, Jace Butler are some other guys. Uh, Jace already decommitted from Illinois, right? So mm -hmm. we haven't heard news on Amani, but I think a lot of people expect Amani could be next. I guess, one, is this a loss for Illinois? And then I want to talk some potential candidates to uh, replace him. But it, first off, is this a loss for Illinois basketball that will hurt them in any way? Mm, maybe optically it hurts them because I think Chester Frazier has kind of cemented himself as like an Illini guy, obviously played there on the staff, um, seems to be extremely loved by players, teammates and all that. So um, it, it was, it's just a little odd that when you're looking at it, just surface level here, G, you have one of your top assistant coaches leaving to be an assistant coach in West Virginia. Like, I, I don't, like, just, if you ended after that, I think that it just doesn't look good, to be honest with me, or to be honest with you. But at the same time, this also leaves Brad an opportunity. He has a seat open, and he could add somebody. And as aggressive as Brad is in the transfer portal, I'm sure he's going to be as aggressive in adding someone to his staff that is great at working the transfer portal, a great recruiter, um, and also just maybe even a good basketball coach. And, you know, you, you look at Chester Frazier's top all-time recruits on to, according to 24-7, uh, Amani Hansberry, Jay Neps, Sincere Harris, you know, those, those are, those are good guys. Don't get me wrong. He, he, he's not, you're not losing an assistant coach to just bringing in top 50 guys. You know what I'm saying? Like he's bringing in good guys, but it's not it just like with all due respect to Chester Frazier, he's not just some cutthroat dog 
recruiting like top 50 kids like him leaving is you losing like all these five-star kids you, obviously losing like Hansberry and you know sincere are, are pieces you're losing but those those guys, those are top 60 kids you know not like or like 65th ranked kids you're not you're not losing uh an assistant coach who's bringing in like top 25 kids or something like that so um I think it sucks optically looking at it just because you have an assistant coach making the lateral move Honestly, maybe even a worse move in my opinion. Uh, but outside of that, it's I don't think it's someone that's not replaceable. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, I think even saying like top sixty-five recruits is generous to a guy like Sincere and Jace Butler. Like the I don't well, know. H- Hansberry was sixty-seven. So okay, even like regardless of where they're ranked, let's talk more like the impact they've had in college, right? Like. Uh, I think Hansberry showed promise in year one. He wasn't a rotation player. Sincere showed promise in year one. Then he opted to willingly sit out of a season because he wasn't good enough. Yeah. Then, like, I, I no, I don't think anybody expected Jace Butler to ever be a starter at Illinois. So, like, yeah, well, you gotta say, you gotta say, you gotta say the other guy too, Jay Neps. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, Epps was probably the best player of this bunch, and again. Yeah. Brad very quickly opted to move away from Jay Neps or Jay Neps opted to move away from Brad either way. But that's the the thing to me is just like, I don't think Brad had a trust level with Chester based on the caliber of players he was bringing in. Like if, if your guys that you're responsible have yielded zero starters that Brad Underwood wanted in his program in year two, then you're probably replaceable. And that my read on this is Brad had that tough conversation and, I think Brad is very content with this outcome and Chester, who knows Chester probably mutually wanted to leave as well. And he's going to bring some of his guys with him and get a fresh start. Um, I think it's sad just because you always want to keep guys that were in the program in the program. It would be good for Illinois basketball if Illinois guys can stay, but at the end of the day, I think they're going to get a better assistant coach than this. Looking forward. I've heard two names named, uh, Again, we're recording this a day before this releases, so who knows? Illinois could literally hire a guy before we even put this video out. The two names that I've heard, one I'm familiar with, one is a star. Orlando Antigua, return to Illinois. With the changes at Kentucky, could they drop a bag? Could they pull Antigua back to Champaign? Certainly an elite recruiter. I think one of the best on-paper assistant coaches in the country that you can get from a talent acquisition standpoint. The second name, the one I'm familiar with, Luke Yaklich, uh, well-known for completely revamping Michigan's defense under John Beeline. He came in, John Beeline gave him the keys to the entire defense, let him coach half the practices, stayed completely out of his hair. Michigan went from a pretty bad defensive program to one of the best defensive teams in the country for a three-year stretch that yielded multiple deep NCAA tournament runs. Uh, Yak, I think, is a very good assistant coach. He also got a lot of praise and a lot of credit for things that were probably personnel-driven more than anything. He went to be a head coach at Illinois Chicago, where he was horrendous and is no longer the head coach. So, um, it, actually, is he is he out at USC? He is, isn't he? Or would they hire yeah, him? He's, yeah. Yeah, he's he's currently unemployed. Okay, I was gonna say that's. I want to just just make sure I got that right. I thought I had that right, but yeah. yeah. Um. So though, again, the last thing I'll add on this: you have a guy who worked with Yaklich in the walls right now. I don't know if he's going to be there long term, but you. I mean, you stole John Sanderson from Michigan. If that wasn't just a meme, if that was actually something that you're intent on helping your program, there's a connection there. I think Sanderson would be very excited to work with Yak again. And it would probably work pretty well between those two. I think either of those two would be a massive upgrade from Chester Frazier from what I've seen. Uh, what do you think? Where's this headed? So I think it'd be a massive upgrade both ways too. But at, at first I was, I came off this episode and I was like, Oh, Antigua, like you can't, you can't argue. He, he, he has obviously experience, a connection to Illinois, his recruit like list speaks for itself. I mean, I, I'm not even going to read off the guys, but like, just know it's it's all high top 10 top 25 kids that's that's who he grabs that's who he has what was illinois biggest issue last season defense now you came on here and you did say that yak maybe got a little bit more credit for, than he deserves for his defense but i think his calling card is defense correct absolutely 
So I see, see. So as much as like, okay, yeah, I want Antigua. I think he'd be great on the recruiting trail and things like that. It, it's, it seems that Brad shifted from even wanting to use the recruiting trail at this point. And I, I think Antigua could also probably be good at transfers as well. But like, wouldn't it kind of make I, – I honestly, I think either way, there's something that each of these assistant coaches could add, and I think they're upgrades. So I, I really don't think you could go wrong. Yeah. Um, I'm with you. I Here's what I'll say. I think Antigua is more likely than Yak, and I don't know if we're right that either of these is the correct name. We might just be wrong. These might just be rumors. I think Antigua is more likely than Yak because of the pre-existing relationship with Brad Underwood. Um, with that said, some of the teams Antigua worked with Underwood on were not great teams at Illinois. He was there for four years. They had a losing record in two of the four years he was there. Now, it was the first two years. Like, Antigua started getting his recruits in, and things flipped very quickly. The best year that Brad Underwood's had, they finished fourth on Ken Palm. Antigua was a large reason why, because he helped build that roster that included Io and Kofi and Trent Frazier, Curbelo, Adam Miller. Like, there was a lot of talent on that roster that Antigua was a huge part of. Um, I think the question to me would be like, what's more important to a long-term Brad Underwood program? If you're debating between these two, would you rather improve the defense and feel good that year over year, it's going to always be better? Or would you rather have a guy who's going to try and bring you in one and done talent? To be honest, I don't think one and done talent does a ton for Illinois at this point because of the way Brad wants to portal. Ooh, and be- wait, but, hold on, but, but to push back on that though, what does the team look like with portal older talented guys and then mix in some one and done talented freshmen? Don't you think that would kind of work? Wouldn't that be the perfect scenario? Probably, probably. But to me, given the way Brad plays the portal, I don't think talent's ever going to be an issue for Illinois. I just don't. Um, now, Antigua will bring in talent, whether it's from the portal or not. So, it, it, like, it's not going to hurt. That would be a great hire. But to me, like, that, you're you're either enhancing something that's not an issue or you're maybe fixing something that is an issue. And, again, it's roster dependent. But last year, like, the want to on defense wasn't there. They had good defenders. The want to wasn't there for much of the season. Like a, a defense that included Coleman Hawkins, Ty Rogers, and Terrence Shannon should not have been as bad as it was. And it was. So um, the the one thing with Yak, I will say, you look back at what he did at Michigan. Um, I'm going to pull up the actual numbers of some of his teams defensively real quick. Uh, I want to make sure. Those, are the, teams like Char- right well, those are the teams like Charles Matthews and them, right? Yeah. I want to make sure I get the years right, too, on – Yak. So let me just pull up the years. I think I could literally tell you just from uh, <laughs> what the Ken Palm defensive rankings are when he showed up. He took over Illinois Chicago in 2020. He was an assistant at Texas for one year. I forgot all about that. So he was an assistant at Michigan uh, in 2017 until 2019. He The year before Luke Yaklich got there, Michigan was 92nd in adjusted defensive efficiency. They were coming off of three consecutive years, 89th, 100, 92nd. Even the years where Beeline had made runs in the early 2010s, 37th, 56th, 37th, 89th. Like he, he never had great defenses. Yak gets there in year one. They go from 92 to 69 defensively. In year two, they go from 69 to third in the country. In year three, they go from third in the country to second in the country. Like he he built an elite defense, and it was John Beeline being like, "Here's the keys. I'm staying out of your hair." Now, the interesting part of it for me, Brad Underwood would need to do that. Like, Yak Yak's whole thing only works if it's like, "Get out of my way. I'm running practice today." And I don't know how Underwood would be with that. I don't know how he coaches practice behind closed doors. Can, um, I, make, can I make can I make a guess? Yeah, make a guess. Yeah, that shit ain't flying. That's I don't know Brad. if it that's, would. That, that, that's Brad's house. That, no, that's an Underwood household. If they want to adopt Yaklich and add Yaklich dash Underwood to his name, that would work. But inside them, them walls right there, that, that seems like an Underwood 
situation. Yeah, I don't know if it would. Um, and again, those teams, like, did they become elite defensively because Yak was a mastermind, or did they become elite defensively because John Beeline recruited Xavier Simpson, Charles Matthews, and Isaiah Livers all at once? Well, it depends what fits my agenda. <laughs> right. So <laughs> I, I of these two, again, I'm a Michigan fan. Of these two, I would hire Antigua, and I wouldn't think twice. Um, I know that goes against I'm what I was saying, that. but – yeah, I'm I'm leaning that way, but I had the same thought process as you. I literally was like, okay, what's their what's their issue? Defense. Get the defensive guy. Get the get the defensive the defensive coordinator, whatever you want to call it. Um, yeah. but at the same time, give me the guy who's his top all time commits are Carl Anthony Towns, Nerlens Noel, Trey Lyles, Kofi Coburn, Carvello, like all the, like give me that guy. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Uh, it would be fun to see Yak and Sanderson reunited, but hey, if one of these two is the hire, I'll be very happy either way. We'll see. Do you think one of these two is the hire? Do you think it's a name that we don't see coming? I honestly think there might be more of a chance that it's Yak because I have a hard time thinking Cal's going to let Antigua go. I feel like he wants to bring him. I, I, there's reports he wanted to bring his whole staff with him. Yeah, you're right. So this might just be rumors at this point. Yeah, I don't know. They could always give like Andre Carbello a GA position too and let him work his way up. I honestly would love that. <laughs> It'd be fun. All right, final topic today. Uh, what the hell is going on at Michigan State? <laughs> I'm sorry. Ah. Just tee it up how I how I can. Uh okay, here's let me lay the ground and why I want this as a topic and why we're gonna talk about this. Uh as we speak today, it's Tuesday morning. Obviously, things move fast, everything could change by tomorrow. Maybe this will be outdated, but at the time of this recording, Frankie Fiddler's delaying his decision. Frankie Fiddler visited Michigan State. They got the final visit over the weekend. By all accounts, it went well. He was rumored to be leaving Wisconsin. Right now, everybody seems to think that it's Wisconsin or Michigan State, and he delays his decision. Uh, typically, if you are the last visit and you were the underdog in a recruitment, that's a good sign. So you could interpret this as maybe things are trending towards Michigan State, having a very real chance to land Frankie Fiddler. That's fantastic. Obviously, they've prioritized that guy. Regardless of how you feel about Frankie Fiddler, this would be a win for Tom Izzo if they were to land a wing they think is a starter-level guy early in the cycle. Uh, with that said, I saw a tweet last night that inspired me to want to ask you what the hell is going on here. Uh, we have news that Trey Townsend has announced three official visits that he's taking. They include Ohio State. Do you remember the other schools? Was it like Ohio State, uh, Texas? Hey. Uh, Arizona. Arizona. Okay. So some big name schools. Oh, uh, no. It was, it what, sorry. Do you already say Ohio State? Ohio State was one. Ohio of them. State was one of them. Yeah. 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 I, I don't know who else it was. It was Ohio State, Arizona, and somebody else. Uh, he also visited Michigan last week or over the weekend, I believe. So Townsend's been making the rounds. Townsend, by all accounts, was interested in Michigan State. Like I, on paper, per his head coach and heard like at anybody just uh, like if, if you have any sort of source in this state at all, Trey Townsend was interested in Michigan state and would want to explore this. Uh, he now sets his official visits. Michigan state is not one of them. Now the fit with Townsend, I get it. It's clunky. I, I think people have screamed about this on the internet enough. It doesn't make a ton of sense. It's clunky. It'd be tough. Xavier Booker has to play the four. Wah, whatever. I have viewed Trey Townsend as a big this whole time, even if he's not a big, right? You need you need to get a front court player and you need to get a wing if you are Tom Izzo. They are prioritizing wings. They're trying to get Frankie Fiddler. They called other wings as well. They set up visits with other wings. Wings have been a priority. Front court players have not. You've told me they've called Cliff. You've told me they've called a couple other names. None of those have matriculated into a visit. None of them have turned serious. As far as, uh, to my eye, there has not been a serious recruitment of a front court player this season. And the most obvious target gift-wrapped guy that Greg Campy would probably prefer goes to Michigan State is Trey Townsend. They're not even going to host him for a visit. I think this makes no sense. Justin Thind, who is a friend of the show, we love Justin, uh, was in the Twitter replies to some people last night who were upset that Townsend's not going to visit Michigan State. And he essentially said, if Michigan State wanted him to visit, he'd be visiting. 
this means they feel good about something else. My interpretation of Justin's tweet without talking to Justin is that Michigan State feels good about Frankie Fiddler. So they do not want to host Trey Townsend because Fiddler's the only guy they have momentum with right now. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong. Fiddler's the only target Michigan State is serious about right now. So if they feel good about something, it's got to be Fiddler. Why is this Fiddler or Townsend and not both? Is this really Frankie Fiddler or a front court player? Because you have multiple spots. What is going on? Uh, Greg, I'm getting there. I'm getting there, man. I'm I it I'm reaching it. I'm it's it's a fastly, fastly approaching. And what I mean by that is my breaking point. Um Coming into this season, we knew we knew what had to be done in the summer as far as players that we needed to add. And once again, we're doing this thing where we want to cast the world's smallest possible net that you could think of and focus in on one guy who's not even the best wing in the portal, by the way. And basically, we got we we got to get that guy. If we don't get that guy, or if we get that guy, that's it. That's all we're doing. And as much as this hurts me to say, I don't even know if this team is active for a front court player right now. I, I really don't. I really don't think they want one. I think they think they're good. And that is terrifying. And that is the sign of this program is not in a healthy spot whatsoever. Because the, if you could watch these past couple of years and not say we need a front court player, then I don't know what you're watching straight up. And I get it. It's Izzo. He's the Hall of Famer. Love Izzo. But I, I can't get on board with whatever this approach is. It's just, it's, it's just putting yourself at a disadvantage. I don't, and for no reason, I don't understand why. For some reason, we want to make adversity. We want to make things difficult when they don't have to be difficult. And – it's possible to recruit more than one players at once. It's possible to recruit more than one position at once. But for some reason, we think that all that is okay is just honing in on one guy. And I I understand like there's definitely probably things that people don't know about. So if they are doing things behind the scenes, shit, I'd be surprised, but it might be happening. But from everything I've heard, seen and everything like that, this team might just roll into next season with the front court that we have. And if that's the case. Yeah. I, I don't think you're alone in this mindset either. Like I'm, I, I'm out. I'm out. I, I don't think you're alone. I think there's a lot of people that have kind of drawn the line and been like, either he fixes this this summer. And by this, I mean the center spot, either he fixes it or he doesn't. Yeah. Wait, 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 one more, one more thing, G. To add to that, before you get going, even if he added someone, and let's say they flopped, I would at least be able to go back and be like, you know what? At least he tried to get somebody, right? At least he, I would give him the least like two percent benefit of the doubt. At least he tried some shit. Right now, we're not trying anything. Right, we're trying one thing. We're trying to get Frankie. We're trying to get Franklin. Yeah, and if we get him, hell yeah, that. It might, what are we? What are we doing after that? Why does that have to be a one? B? Can we not multitask? So here's my issue. We're getting little bits of what the staff is doing and what they want, right? They're not the most public facing program in the world. That's by design. That's okay. Like keeping things in house is okay when you win games and when you operate off season successfully. Um. My issue is the little bits that we are getting, whether from interviews or from reports of interest, visits, et cetera, all lead me to believe that the staff has no idea what they're doing with the front court (laughs) because you add them together and none of them make sense. Like, let me walk you through some that like individually, all of these make sense to me individually, but then the action the staff is taking in a conclusion to these little bits is so twisted and backwards and hurtful to this program. We are told Xavier Booker's going to play the four. 
right? We are told this. We, there's a variety of reasons for this. We are told Xavier Booker and his family and his camp and clutch want him at the four. So if you want Xavier Booker happy, he's a four. Okay. I've said on record, I wouldn't do that. I disagree with that. I think he should play the five, but whatever. If, if that's what Xavier Booker needs and the staff has accepted, he's a four. Okay. Do you have, well, you have something here? The only thing I have to ask you, if it is a situation it's like playbook at the four or he leaves, what do you say? Fine, play him at the four. But also, my behind closed doors answer would be, okay, lie. Like, <laughs> like, like, tell him he's a four and then start him at the five. He's not leaving. That that, that, like, that would be my answer, by the way. Just throw that out there. Like, who, right. just play him in the front court. Four or five, it doesn't matter. Just put them both out there. And I'm going to be honest with you. Look, I don't know Xavier Booker or his camp or clutch, obviously. I, look, I would assume what Xavier Booker wants more than anything is minutes. I don't think he cares where those minutes come. Last year, he played, what, like six minutes a game? I, I don't think Xavier Booker is going to complain if he plays 32 minutes at the five. I think he just wants to play. So, but regardless, the point is, I am, I am understanding and I am accepting and buying that this staff says Xavier Booker's our four. Okay, so you got your four. What else has happened then next to him? If he's going to play the four, you still need somebody to play the five, right? Okay, let's go through this. Mati Sissoko's gone. Good step, because he could have he could have welcomed Mati back with open arms. Instead, Mati Sissoko is in the transfer portal. He's gone. That's a good step. This is like, okay, we're going to go get someone. Great. The next rumbling we hear is that he's begging Jackson Kohler back. So I, I, I don't have an issue with that. I want Kohler to stay in Michigan State. I still think he can be a good basketball player. But if you're begging Jackson Kohler back and you know Carson Cooper's coming back and you know Xavier Booker's not playing the five, you're left with a roster that has two centers. Typically, Izzo wants three. He likes to rotate those guys. You still need someone. You're not targeting anyone. And my interpretation of this is they're begging Kohler back instead of targeting centers. Like, they they want Jackson Kohler to return and be their center or one of their centers with Cooper instead of going and getting a different center. Otherwise, like, why would they not be targeting people? Why would they not be seriously? And again, to me, I get Townsend small. He's not a center. But to me, you could absolutely play Townsend and Booker together. Tell Booker he's the four. I, I don't care. To me, that would work. And again, for a staff and a coach that has so often prioritized guys with relationships, with, with family ties, with, oh, he played with this guy who's already on my roster. There is no player in the portal that you have a better tie to than the guy Greg Campy coached who would love to see him at Michigan State. There just isn't. Like, Townsend probably would be in green and white immediately if Michigan State wanted him. And we're told they don't. I just don't understand it. Um, well, I, you, you, you shouldn't understand it. It's stupid. It's stupid. Or, or at least, it's like, tell, show me you have something else going on. Like, adding up the idea Booker's are for – we want Kohler back and we're not targeting centers. That like, to me, that's like a, the straw is broken here. Like I can't, I cannot process this staff for four years watching the center spot be what it is. And then saying, all we need is Frankie Fiddler and we're good. Like, and this could change. Maybe, maybe they get Fiddler and maybe two weeks from now they start recruiting centers, but you already missed out on some great centers. And to me, that signals incompetence because they should be doing both right now. Yes, they should be. They should be, and they're not. And it's, like I said, I'm reaching my breaking point, and y'all don't want to see me at my breaking point. Some people in our Discord speculated, could they only be targeting one spot right now because they don't have verbal confirmation that A.J. Hogart is gone? What What more do you – also, don't take his confirmation. Tell him to go. Tell him to pack his bags. You don't – like, what – it's called being proactive. Be proactive. If AJ Hogarth for some odd reason comes back, then maybe you don't. Maybe you, you go back and tell it like that's you got to do something with that guy, or you make it work. You do something to make it work. But if you're that, if you're telling me that AJ Hogarth is the holdup on what we need to do for next season, then I actually am going to do something that I'm 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 gonna like I'm gonna punch my screen or something. I'm gonna break something. 
I'm going to break my ring light. Don't do that. Don't do that. Uh, yeah, I, I've been discussing this in the Michigan state channel in the discord for a bit, but, uh, I used to think it was stubbornness with the portal Michigan state stuff. Thought it was just stubbornness. I could understand stubbornness. Even if I disagreed with it, I could understand it. I'm starting to think it's incompetence and I can't understand incompetence because this off season Izzo has said, we're going to use the portal. I am using the portal. Give me Frankie Fiddler. But if you're willing to use the portal and not address the most obvious glaring hole that has been there for four seasons, that that's incompetence. That's not stubbornness. That's this staff has no idea what they're doing. Me, meanwhile, just to rub a little bit more salt into the wound, I'm looking across the Big Ten and other Big Ten teams at centers. Yeah. Umar Balo, Aaron Bradshaw, like Vlad Golden <laughs> are all likely to be Big Ten bound. And they're begging Jackson Kohler back and won't host Trey Townsend for a visit. I hate my life. I can't. I just can't process this. And again, I think coming into this offseason, everyone in the fan base correctly said, if he doesn't get a center, we're giving up. Through a month, it seems like it's giving up time. <laughs> like, this is crazy. Yeah team, get, team, yeah, team give up is out to an early lead. It's early, though. Keyword early. A lot of, lot of offseason still to go. Maybe Enoch Boache will stay in the portal. Is he in the portal? I think so, isn't he? <laughs> That's hilarious. You, you haven't called him yet? You should know. No, I'm, I I tapped out. Is the takeaway from this that you're a bad recruiter? I mean, you were you were DMing all these guys. No, if if I was the head of recruiter, I would have I would have had visits set up. I would have I would have had visits set up. Yeah. The thing is, like we we aren't we aren't even calling anybody. I don't think the thing is, like I think we're sending like a text maybe or something like that, but like no type of proactiveness is going on here. So what it like is my interpretation of Thin's tweet correct though? Like they they feel good about Frankie Fiddler. So they don't need a front court player. I, I honestly I don't know. I don't inter I I don't interpret it one way or the other. Unless Justin has some like info on a front court player that's to be named later that he's not telling anyone. If he does, I need to text him. You better tell me. Yeah, I just I need I'm, something. I'm baffled by the posturing of like, well, if the staff wanted Townsend, we would get Townsend. Like, as if that's an okay, acceptable answer for Michigan State fans. Like, like, huh? What? I would, that's like an insult. Like, to, if I'm a fan of somebody who's saying that about my, like, that's an insult to me. Like, they don't, they don't want a really good player in the front court. And we're, yeah, huh? I, I, like I said, I can't explain it. Okay. Uh, last I, thing, I, some people, I'm broken. Some people in our Discord, last thing, uh, I thought this was a fair point speculated. Like, how do you think Jeremy fears and Xavier Booker feel about this? Like if this is actually what's going on, are, are the good players that are the core of your team this upcoming season, are they frustrated that their staff isn't going and getting better players to help them? I'm going to, I'm going to only speak on what I know and I'm going to be vague just for the sake of just, just for the sake of it. But I know this for a fact. I've heard this for a fact. This is not going to fly. It's not going to fly. I'm talking about it's not going to fly with the play. It's not, this is not going to make players happy. Mm. I might have to not. Hit you up. I'm going to have to hit you up offline because I haven't heard this. It is, it is not going to make players happy. Interesting. Okay. All right. Thanks for entertaining that topic today. One big thing presented by no one. What do you got? You guessed this word. <laughs> let's play a little let's play a little let's play a little quick game of hangman here actually why not do this what's the last time you played hangman uh like high school okay guess a letter mm. a there is an a there good work i feel like you spelled this wrong <laughs> yeah i did <laughs> You did, didn't you? <laughs> I put one too many dash marks. God. Yeah, I, I literally, I knew what the word was. <laughs> it's the word washed. 
<laughs> uh, my one big thing is the summer of health and wellness has begun. Uh, yesterday I went on a run and then I went to the range and then I golfed nine holes and then I came home and ate a salad. How kind of salad? Uh, just like a, a chicken Caesar salad. Chicken Caesar? Yes. Nice. I got my first day of golf league today. Nice. Yeah. Good luck. So I get to, try, get to try out the new sticks. Can't wait. See those? I'm excited to might be taking this, might be taking this to my temple if things don't start turning around. Am I right? All right. All right, everybody. Have a great day. We'll be back Thursday.